Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about the future. Where is humanity going? Where do we want it to go? What are the pitfalls we have to avoid in order to get there? And what can we do to influence the future in a positive way? I'll be speaking with two futurists. A bit later in the show, we'll have a pre-taped interview with Professor David Passig, a futurist from Bar Ilan University in Israel. But now, I'd like to introduce another futurist, John Smart. John is director of the Acceleration Studies Foundation, which is a foresight research organization in Mountain View, California. He's co-founder of the Evo Devo Universe Research Community, which is an international community of scholars exploring evolutionary and developmental change. And he's also director of the Emerging Technology Master's Degree Program at the University of Advancing Technology in Phoenix, Arizona. He has a master's degree in future studies from the University of Houston and is a frequent blogger on futurist issues. John, you're not only a futurist, but you also help to train other futurists. What can you tell me about that? Well, Marty, it's a, a fascinating field. It's only been around for uh, since the 1970s. The first uh, program was started at Houston, where I got my master's degree. Um, and there's about 18 of them in the world now. Um, most are masters, but about four or five of them are PhDs as well. And uh, like I said, it's a fascinating, very small field that helps you look more than three years out into the future. Now, what, what, what kind of disciplines do you have to master to be a futurist? Well, if you're looking less than three years out, you can do strategic planning like we've seen in, in the business community. But if you're looking further than that, you have to do things like horizon scanning, where you're looking at new things that could become issues that are not issues today. You have to um, create what are called scenarios, which are possible futures, and then imagine if your strategy is ro to see if you can create strategy that is going to be ro robust to those. Is, is the goal to decide upon a desirable future and then try to figure out how to get there? Or do you try to figure out where we're going, whether we want to get there or not? Well, uh, a famous futurist named Roy Amara said there are possible, probable, and preferable futures. So the possible are the ones that uh, we could create. The artists, uh, uh, the science fiction authors, are in uh, uh, masters of those. The probable are the ones the scientists are discovering for us, and the social scientists, the, the direction that that uh, society and technology seems to be going in the universe. And the preferable are the ones you just mentioned, the ones that we create agendas for and try to make happen because we prefer them, uh, our values guide us in those directions. Now, your work has a lot to do with accelerating technologies, the idea that technology is accelerating at a constantly increasing rate. What can you tell us about that? Well, uh, the book Future Shock in 1970, which I'm sure you Alvin remember, yes, uh, is probably the first book that made it obvious to us in the Western world, in the modern Western world, that technology was going faster and faster every year. Uh, it was one of the most popular books when it came out in 1970. It still sells very well today. And the first three chapters are all about this accelerating change and the shock that it brings to us trying to adapt to it. Uh, our organization was started in 2003 to try and study these issues because there wasn't any nonprofit out there studying accelerating change. Is, rap is rapidly accelerating change a desirable goal? Do we want it to accelerate faster and faster? Usually when things keep accelerating faster and faster, they crack up at some point. Yes, although there's a small subset of things that don't seem to do that. Uh, nanotechnologies, computing technologies, and communication technologies are really the big three that always accelerate no matter what humans do. Whether we want them to or not, it seems to be just our interaction with technology makes those three go faster every year. And they, when they do so, they use less resources, less matter, less space, less energy and time to create the next generation. So they don't run into resource limits like all the other things in the human world. So if our technology keeps on developing at the pace that it's going or even at a faster rate, what do you think that's gonna make the world look like and say, 20 years from now? Well, probably many of the social and economic and political uh, environments that we have today will, will look very much the same. Humans don't um, adapt to rapid change. We like, we like to slow down and simplify as our technology speeds up and complexifies all around us. 
But the technology itself, however, I think will be very different. And I think we'll reach a point where uh, our technologies capture and surpass all of the highest human uh, attributes that we have. And that'll be a very interesting world where our technologies become, if you will, aspects of our higher humanity. So then we can talk of ourselves as a biological self and as an electronic self. And what's going to happen in the electronic space is going to be very different from what's going to happen in the space that we're currently living Does in. Does that mean that uh, machines might be smarter than people? I think that uh, today many machines are already quite a bit smarter than people in very narrow areas. My uh, calculating watch, smarter than me at calculating and at timekeeping. But those are very narrow areas of intelligence. Chess playing, we've seen the Watson computer beat the best uh, Jeopardy champions just last year. Bit by bit by bit, machines are picking up narrow areas of intelligence and reaching what's called a singularity, which means a point of human surpassing machine intelligence. Now, there's a concept called spiritual machines. In fact, you have a book in front of you written by Ray Kurzweil, who's a very well-known futurist. Maybe you could hold up the book, in fact. The age of spiritual machines, does that imply that the machines will have a soul and they'll have their own desires and their own will. They want to straighten up the book, you can see. Yeah, camera three. Okay, I think we got it. Well, those are pretty interesting speculations, aren't they? Uh, to what extent, as the machines develop our higher features, do they have uh, our emo uh, emotions? Do they have values? Do they have consciousness? And do they have uh, a spiritual soul or our self? Um, there are many scientists today that would argue that everything about human beings that makes us human is physical, and we are in the process of adding those processes to machines to create what are called biologically inspired computers, computers that have all of our same physical processes. So if you and I are spiritual machines, very mm -hmm. complex physical patterns, as we learn to put those patterns into technology, they will develop those same things as well. And as Kurzweil likes to say, there will come a point where the machines may wake up and very um, likely they won't understand everything about the universe. So they'll have a spiritual relationship to the universe just like you and I do. We're going to continue this conversation shortly, but before we do, we have a video taped previously with David Passig. David Passig is a futurist who specializes in technological, social, and educational futures, as well as the future of conflict. He's an associate professor at Bar Ilan University in Israel, where he heads the graduate program in information and communication technology, as well as the virtual reality lab. He's written two books that were bestsellers in Israel. They are The Future Code and 2048. He's a frequent lecturer and consultant and has a Ph.D. in Anticipatory Anthropology from the University of Minnesota. Let's go ahead and roll that tape. 